The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Give him a moment of silence as a believer, true priest, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. The only way to study the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You say, Ron, I'm saved. Yes, but you might be carnal. How would I know evidence of personal sin in your own conscience? The Holy Spirit's been grieved. He's been quenched. He's worked conviction in your heart. Your, even your own conscience has brought conviction to you. About sin, it could be mental attitude sins, it could be sins of the tongue, it could be overt sins. But you're aware of it. The inner dialogue of your, of, of, of your own life tells you. So what do you do? You can't study the Bible in carnality anymore than an unbeliever. So what do you do? Well, you can, First John 1, 9 says you confess your sin. Why? Not for salvation in that passage, but for sanctification, to allow the Holy Spirit who still indwells you but has been quenched and grieved to now take again responsibility over your spiritual growth and men mentality and the influence of your life in the word of God. First John 1 9 says if we confess our sin, homologeo means to name it, cite it, state it. It's important for your own soul. I mean, God knows, but it's important for your own soul, own soul to understand yet you have to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. You have sin because you moved away from the ministry of the spirit into the desires of the flesh and took it to fulfillment by desire and you committed a sin. Don't sit around with all your guilt and shame or whatever with it. Confess it and come back into the father and get back in the program. You know, you fall down on the football field, you get back up, you finish the game. What are you talking about? So. We'll give you a moment to do that, those who are with us in the study, as well as those who are with us on the Internet. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your marvelous grace and the freedom we have to assemble and not be censored except by our own. So don't, I'm reminded what he told Paul. He said, Paul, don't let him silence you. Don't let him silence you. Just remember, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. They're not in charge over your life, and you're not in charge over your life, but I am, and I am faithful in my charge over you. We need to be mindful of that, and I thank for the freedom we have in America today, in Birmingham, Alabama. And I pray tonight as we look at Paul's second missionary trip, so many things were revealed to him. It's just amazing to me. But being in the ministry myself, I do understand these, these times with God when he just reveals things about your ministry that are ministry changer, changers. And uh, it's a privilege for me, Father. It's a privilege for me to look into the life of this great minister. And reflect myself in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Paul receives two special ministry changing visions. The visions that changed his ministry in the direction of it on the second missionary trip. We saw the first one in the, the 16th chapter of Acts. And now we see the second one. The first one was at Troas in Asia Minor. And the second one was at Corinth of Archaea. Uh, the first special ministry, as we have studied in detail, it was important to Paul, to Paul because God told him, you know I called you to the Gentiles, yes sir, I want you to go westward. And, and Paul knew what God meant by that, I want you to go, I want you to go to Italy and then I want you to go to Spain. And he knew that, I want you to go to Italy and Spain. Now he was in Macedonia and Archaea Asia Minor and so God laid him out the map and the map was very clear to a guy like Paul as a Roman citizen he understood the Roman Empire 
and it was following the Roman Empire off from the Mediterranean Sea. And you, you know, Roman history, the Mediterranean Sea is a pretty good sea. Uh, I think Calvin said you was on that sea, uh, an American Navy, and it, it's a pretty good size. I mean, it don't look big on a map. <laughs> Neither does Lake Michigan, but if you get out there in a boat, you can't swim if you're halfway out there unless you're a real athlete. Do I? Jonah. Jonah, Jonah found out it was a really big one. Um, but what was interesting about that is Rome considered it their lake. They considered the, that, that was Rome's lake when they ruled the empire. And they ruled every, every piece of land that touched that lake they owned. I mean, they were not content unless they owned it and controlled it. Um, I guess for us, it would be kind of like control the airs and the sea. And they wanted control. That was. You have you have no idea how much money flowed up and down that. That the Romans called a lake that was really a sea. You have no and Rome controlled it. They're going to be sure they control it. Well, anyhow, um, we still see nations that are connected with water, how important uh, their um, front line of defense is connected with it. You know, even, even though there's great power from the air. Um, <coughs> well, anyhow, there, there's uh, the, the, so that, that was the first thing that was really important to Paul. The second special ministry uh, changing vision was that Paul got was at Corinth in our study today and it was confirmed to Paul what was confirmed to him was God's call to the Gentiles I want you to go to the Gentiles I want you to think that way and he and he makes it very clear on the second trip what this is about and this is really important because Paul on the third trip is going to make is going to stumble on some of these issues and is really going to get caught on it um, this is this is a, a night another night vision uh, w with Paul um, and there are I want to show you some things that he said to Paul because I've been talking to you it's a it's important for most of you in this room are spiritual mature believers now your security and your salvation nobody could persuade you away from it You've documented it by scripture out of the word of God. When you do that, you move into a period where you begin to be focused on the will of God. The will of God becomes so important to your life once you're secured in your salvation. Once you begin to understand how important the will of God is in different avenues of your life, your marriage, your job, this and that. And you get mature in your walk in that will of God, the direct will of God. He's going to tell you in your life, he's going to reveal to you details of it that are important to you personally. Details of it. And here's a classic example of it in Paul's life. Here's the second night vision regarding his ministry to the Gentiles. First, First thing he tells him, watch this now as he goes through it. The, these are called details of the directive will. First, no longer be afraid. Do not be afraid. No longer be afraid. It, that's an imperative. It's a negative imperative. Don't be afraid. Stop that. No longer be afraid. You go and you speak what I tell you to speak. You go speak what I tell you to speak where I tell you to speak it. And do not be afraid. That's number one. Because Paul was, Paul was feeling the heat of the pressure. Number two. He says go on speaking. Go on speaking the truth. Do not compromise what I send you to speak. Do not compromise it. You go on speaking. Laleo. And that's an imperative. 
You go on speaking what I tell you. You speak the truth of the word of God. You, you, you speak what I have sent you to speak. You represent me. You don't represent anybody else. You represent me. And do not compromise what I tell you. The third thing is, watch this now. Do not let anybody silence you. I'm going to tell you how important that was to Paul. They would tell Paul. They'd take him to court and they'd tell him. Don't you say, don't you go preach that stuff anymore. So what would Paul do when he went to prison? Yeah. You know why? It's what he was sent to do. Don't let anybody silence you. I don't care if they put you in prison. Listen. This is such, this is so going to be so inbred into him. By the word of God, this detail of the will of God is going to be so inbred into him. By the time it comes for him to be martyred, you know what they're going to have to do to him? They're going to have to take his head. I'm serious. It's the only way you can shut this man up. You could put him in jail. You could have him in the stocks. I don't care what you do with him. Wherever he goes. He's on a mandate. Do, listen to this. Do not be silent. The, the, these, are, these are details of the directive will of God that were ministry changers in Paul's life. See the word for on your paper? There's two of them. And they're a compound conjunction. It's dia plus hote in the Greek language. These are kind of interesting conjunctions because they give you reasons. Now, listen, he gave one, do not be afraid. Two, these, and these are imperatives. Two, always preach, always communicate, laleo, always communicate the truth of the word of God and never back down for nothing. Number three, let nobody silence. What I, when I send you someplace, don't let anybody, do not compromise what I send you. Do not shut down what I tell you, tell you, tell them. Now he gives the first reason. Now he's going to give, he's going to give two with the first hote. He's going to do, the, both of these words for is, is deote. And he's going to give two reasons here and one reason there. The, these are, these are, these are reasons why you do one, two, and three. I'm going to tell you, here are three things you must do. And here are three reasons why. Right? Okay. The, this is very important. That D-I-O-T-I -I business. Four, number one. Th th right? I got, did he lay out three reasons that were ministry changers? Yes. Now he's going to give them three reasons why. Number one, I am with you. I am with you. Like, like I, I, listen, and, and listen, Paul, when God says this to Paul, he, he knows God's speaking Isaiah 41.10. Probably, probably, I didn't look at it, but probably if you have a study Bible, you're probably, they're going to probably give you Isaiah 41.10 because it's almost right there. I mean, it, it, it's, it's exactly, God is speaking to him, and when he does, he knows where that scripture is. Just like somebody tells you a scripture, if you know that scripture, you know, yeah, I'm familiar with Isaiah 41.10. So when he says, I am with you, that's kind of like if somebody, if I say to you, you know God will never leave nor forsake you, right? Is that not a common idea? Well, this was common for Paul. This was in Isaiah 41.10. I am with you. I'm with you. But with the same concept, I'm with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Buddy, everybody else may forsake you. I promise you, I will never. And boy, did that come important to Paul many times in his ministry. So that's what, this is one of these phrases. This is an Isaiah 41.10 idea. For I am with you. Two, second reason. And no one will attack you in order to harm you. Nobody. Listen, that's that fence. You know, we talk about that firewall. That's a firewall, baby. 
when God sends you out there, he says, don't you worry about it. And Jesus said, look, I, I understood that firewall. I could have called 10,000 angels. I understood that firewall. This is what he tells to Paul. Listen, there's nobody. If anybody gets in there, it's because they've got in there by my permission, buddy. <laughs> that For Job, this was the hedge around. For Satan, that was the hedge around Job. I call it a firewall. And no one will attack you in order to harm you. And the third one, and he comes to, to a hote, uh, or a, a dio hotai. He says, for, third reason, for I have many city, I have many people in this city. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you stay there long enough to meet them. But listen. I love this idea. Look, not only am I there with you, I sent you there and I will always be with you. I'll never leave you. I mean, I'm there. I got the firewall with me. Just know that. But listen, also know this. There are a, there's a whole pivot of believers in this city that are on your side and praying for you. They may not know your name, but they've been praying for your presence. God, send me somebody can teach me the word of God. Send me somebody that can speak to these people the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, because they won't listen to me any longer. I got people, they said they got people. I got people in my family will not listen to me any longer. Please, God. I mean, this is John Dyer. I mean, please, God, send somebody to my family. I mean, we've all been there, haven't we? I mean, you do, if you love God and you're a normal human being, you got neighbors and you got family members. And, and so he says, and I want you to know, Paul, you're not the only knee that hasn't bowed to Baal. That's the, that's the idea. When you go into that city, it, as bad as it looks, know that the people have been praying for you to get you where you are. I'm not the only guy that sent you. Prayers have sent you. Isn't that wonderful to know that? You can know that. Let me tell you, I don't care where you go. When you go in your heart knowing that God has sent you, you can know that you're there because God wants you there and that other people there want you and you may never meet them or know them. Their knee is not bowed to Baal either. Isn't that comforting? There ought to be comfort for anybody that goes out into mission work, whether it be home or foreign. There were six things identified here to Paul. That were details of his call to the Gentiles. Do you understand that? You will before I get through tonight. And these details are so important that Paul must never forget them. These details are as large as life. And Paul must never forget these. These are ministry changers for him. And God is going to hold him accountable for this if he starts messing with them. All right. Because he's going to, on the third missionary trip, he's going to start messing with them. I'm just giving you a heads up. Okay, I'm giving you a heads up. I'm giving me a heads up. Let me tell you. And so there's always a pivot out there of people whose knee is not bowed to bail. So listen, just and just know that just. Just know that God has a pivot of people that are out there slugging it out just like you that you may not know. Every once in a while, we run across them, don't we? In some of the strangest places, we run across people that love the Lord. And you go like, oh, my goodness. And, and we're just like kin people when we meet them, aren't we? When we get to talk and they're just on fire for God. I met with a person like that today. I mean, just, you go like, oh, man. Just exciting. So, this is in a response to uh, Acts 18, 9, and 10. These details of the directive will to Paul about his ministry. This was in response to an earlier statement by Paul's conflict in the Jewish synagogue at Corinth. In verse in verse six of chapter 18, I wrote on your paper and when they resisted or opposed. And blaspheme, he shook off his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own head. He's speaking to Jews in Jewish language. I am clean from now on. I, from now on, but listen, I want you to circle from now on. 
just circle that on your paper because Paul didn't on his. And he should have. Because when God said from now on, that was another very important message to Paul from now on. And Paul got it. And Paul stated it. Then Paul went back on it. And he went back on it. Even when God sent him great ministers, he sent him Agabus and a lot of other people that Paul knew were spiritual, mature people that pleaded with Paul not to go east. I mean, when God reveals this kind of stuff in your head, you really need to pay attention to it because you're mature enough to get it and you're mature enough to be held accountable for it. Uh, blood being on your own head or hands. Ezekiel, I don't think this is on your paper. Um, Ezekiel 3.18. Ezekiel 18.13. Ezekiel 33, 6 through 8. Some of those are probably on your paper. I mean, uh, on uh, not your paper, but probably in your reference Bible. Probably some of that's in your reference Bible. I forgot the look of mine. Uh, sh uh, shaking out his garment. That was kind of interesting. That comes from Nehemiah 5.13. And when they did that... Uh, it's, it's it, one of the things might be interesting to those who attend my Sunday services. Uh, when, they got th when they would do that in an official way, the people that were positive would say amen. I thought that was, that was kind of interesting. That, that's not extra for that. I didn't. Uh, on, where, where are you at? Be on our own heads. Your blood be on our. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. That's why I have a good congregation. Um, and let me tell you, in uh, last, uh, I think it was Sunday, uh, where I was dealing with John 10, 10 and uh, like 11 through 21 on that. I told you that there was a key, uh, there was a prophecy given in that to the church age. It was John 10, 16, when he said that I have, I have other sheep, not of this fold. This is Paul right here. I have other sheep of not of this fold is Gentiles. And that was Paul's ministry. And. <clears throat> Paul had been called to be a, a primary shepherd uh, to the Gentile people. Uh, let, me, let me talk about a few things here. I think I have four points. Uh, besides the things mentioned above, Paul learned a great deal about his ministry to the Gentiles on the second missionary trip. Let me mention just a few on your paper. First, the first thing he learned that the Jewish synagogue was no longer a good fishing hole for the grace gospel. The phrase from now on. I mean, I, Paul didn't believe in tattoos, but if he did, he should have put one on, but he didn't believe in them. Uh, and he was told from now on, go to the Gentiles. Go to the Gentiles. And the word is peruamai which means your journey of life. The second thing that Paul learned is the importance of the church house. I mean, it was in Corinth when he spent 18 months, he saw the power of a local church. He never stayed long enough in the past to really see and help organize and get it to be functional. And th on this trip, because he spent 18 months in Corinth and he and right away, God opened that door for him. The synagogue shut down and the house next door to it because the synagogue leader got saved and the got and got good. God is so good. Uh, so th this was another thing. It was very important. This now the church house is going to become a big issue in Christianity. 
And this occurred on the second missionary trip. I mean, Paul is going to put some structure with it. And it's going to be very beneficial. When, and you know, listen to me. And this is so important. When you read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, and now it's well worth going back and reading, you see all these things structured out in his life. I mean, the great teaching on the church, on the, 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 the organizational aspect of the church, the Eucharist and all these other things, spiritual gifts for the body of Christ in a local group, all of that, see, all of that stuff, is written to the Corinthians because of this long stay there, and he got a, a larger picture of what God wanted with the local assembly. He understood the local assembly through the synagogue. When he shut down, he carried that concept. Well, I don't know what to do, Lord, because, you know, I'm a grace guy, not a law guy, so what am I going to do? And he said, well, listen. And so he sets him down for 18 months and allows him to get this structure ingrained in his soul, and now he's he's... Now we really have a functional, quote, local church after the second missionary trip. Um, the third thing that Paul learned was to preach a grace gospel of salvation without charge. It is on the second trip right here. Uh, don't, don't go in making a charge. and Don't pass the bucket. Uh, you're not going to, you, 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 I will show you how to finance your ministry. I, this is this is my deal, and so, uh, and he learned that with Priscilla and Aquila. They come along and said, "Well, Paul, I got a business, and any any anytime you you want to earn a little money, just come on work with us." And he went, "I can do that." So, and then he learned at the same time, if if you've got money, don't. It's not about money, so don't don't do that. If I give you money then that's to go full time when you don't have any, then I'm going to give you a break from that and you're going to work a little bit and see what the common man that you're trying to win to Christ to see what the, his life is like. It's just, it's not about money, Paul. When he met, made tents, it wasn't about money. It's about getting a different look at the people you're carrying the gospel to. And we preachers hang around preachers so much that... And you'd go Chick-fil-A or something. So I wrote down some, I, I, I try to tease you to read a little bit when he writes back to the Corinthians. Now you have a great deal of understanding with what's going on in Paul's life as he writes back in 1 Corinthians 4 on this issue. And, of course, the most famous passage is 2 Corinthians 9, 7 through 14. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 2, 9, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, for you recall, brethren, our labor and hardships, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim the gospel to you, God. See that? I mean, that's, that, was his, that was the deal. And so when Paul got a contribution from the church, from other believers somewhere, it, he was so appreciative to God. You know why? So he could devote all of his time to the work of the Lord. And yet he understood if he was in prison, there was a ministry whole thing there. I'm going to learn about another, another section of people that are being missed with the gospel. When he was in the marketplace working sometimes, he learned that here's a whole group of... Listen, one of Paul's... Listen to me how God works in your life. One of, great, one of, great, one of Paul's great fishing holes everywhere he went was a marketplace. And God always kept him... At some point, one of the things in working in the tent making business, it kept him abreast of the marketplace people, the business and worker section. This guy, I mean, God doesn't do any of this stuff by accident in your life. You know, pastors, well, you know, uh, I left the church. Why'd you leave the church? Well, they got financially down and couldn't afford me. Couldn't afford me. Couldn't afford you? Who ever heard of such a thing? Can't afford you. Young guys would come out. Churches would, from here, would call young guys and and they wanted to make some kind of a big salary there. And the church says, I can't do it. Maybe we can work into it. We'll, we'll give you this and that. 
And they, I said, well, you went, didn't you? They said, no, I passed it up because they couldn't pay me. Couldn't pay you. What are you talking about couldn't pay you? I mean, Paul, you couldn't pay me. I always feel that's probably God anyhow. Is this God? Well, I don't know. I'm not going to talk about it. I just, I just know God's got something out going on, so I don't play with it. Here's the second thing I want you, want you to. It's interesting to examine God's development of Paul's calling to the ministry of the Gentiles. You may not realize how intense God was with Paul to get him to the Gentile ministry uh, through the Roman Empire. For example, and I'm just going to mention how, how God, and, and what I'm trying to tell you, that God is after developing us spiritually. And whatever your spiritual gift is, he's trying to develop you. For Paul, in this great ministry, in his conversion, in his conversion, God had sent him Ananias to mentor him in the ministry to the Gentiles. When you read verse 15, and, and you should do this on your own, go, this, this is what God told Ananias to tell Paul. And he's just been converted. For go, he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and sons of Israel. And he will suffer many, much for my name's sake. Paul when he writes back to the Philippians, he said, this is true for all of us. Not only to believe, but to suffer. Remember Philippians 129? The second time God brings, uh, brings this out to Paul is on Paul's first missionary trip. It's on his first missionary trip that God confirms his call to Paul to the ministry of Gentiles. You need to read this passage I wrote on your paper, 13, Acts 13, 46 through 52. And the 14th chapter, verse 24, off that first missionary trip, it's in verse 46 that Paul realizes that he's been sent to the Jew first. But because they reject the gospel and have judged themselves unworthy of eternal life, he must go to the Gentiles. In the 14th chapter, verse 25, God reminds him that I always will have an open door to the Gentiles. Quit trying to force doors open to the Jews when I've got wide open doors to the Gentiles. And Paul has got, he didn't get, I mean, God told him that on the first trip, but here he is back to the old fishing hole that's just opposed to everything he says and attacking him on every word that comes out of his mouth. And this time, God sets him down on the second missionary trip and says, look. <laughs> so, Paul's missionary, Paul's ministry uh, to the Gentiles was recognized by all of the apostles of Jesus at the Jerusalem conference in Acts 15. When he comes off the first missionary trip, he goes in, he has this great conference on grace versus law for salvation, and the big buzz at the whole conference was Paul's great ministry to the Gentiles off that first missionary trip. And so God reaffirms it with all these people. Go to the Gentiles, Paul. Peter's been called to the Jews, and you've been called to the Gentiles. Peter's apostle to the Jew. You're an apostle to the Gentiles. And it doesn't ring a bell yet. On the second missionary trip, God reaffirms Paul's call to the mission in our, our text. In, in Acts 18, 1 through 17, which we're studying today, Paul, you are an apostle to the Gentiles. Act like one. <laughs> Act like it. Then on Paul's first missionary trip, he departs from the details of the directive call that came to him out of the first trip and the second trip. That was to go westward and then the details of it in regard to it. Paul chose to go against the details of the directive will of God by going eastward to Jerusalem, and he got in a peck of trouble. And I'm going to tell you, the message I have for me and for you as spiritually mature people, pay attention to the details of the directive will of God. When he lays them out in your life, you better pay attention to them. 
And so if you want to read about that, and and it's a, anyhow, you can read about it. You probably haven't been kept up with this, but the fifth thing that Paul learned, you know, I told you he learned some things. He learned another great lesson from God about the importance of obeying the details of the directive will of God. Right? Many spiritual mature believers told Paul not to go eastward to Jerusalem, and they told him many times, yet he went anyway. The third thing on our study, apostate Jewish religion. Listen, we need to listen to this today in America. Apostate Jewish religion hired mob violence to silence Paul as well as to force the local government to do their dirty work. You can read about that in Acts 18, 12 through 17, when they take Paul to court and uh, Galileo throws it out because he sees through the foolishness of it. They use the same tactic against Jesus, right, with Pilate. These religious cowards hide in the shadow of secrecy and use local government to their advantage. And thank goodness for a guy like Galileo that goes like, not here, bud, not here. This is a typical ploy of Cosmos Diabolicus of the angelic conflict against the gospel of grace salvation. And we see it in America. And the problem is we Americans, we, we let them silence us. You know what God would tell you? You don't let him silence you. I'm the guy. I'm the guy. I've got the hedge. You don't let the you don't let him silence you. Now, you may take the hit for it, and that's okay too. Right? I mean, you may get in a fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But look, it don't matter. I got all that under control, right? I mean, you got to understand this stuff. You got to understand this. Listen, we live in a day like this. This is our time right here. This is, the, this is what we're going through right now in America. I mean, we're going through this. I mean, they say, you can't do this in the school. You can't do this in the public square. You can't do this in the... You, you, you can't do this uh, where if you live in an apartment complex, you can't do that. We have a, a censorship on, on people doing that. Well, listen, some people, I meet my neighbors and they say, good morning. I say, do you know Jesus? Amen. Other people say, good morning. God bless America. It's a wonderful day. I say, hmm, I love Jesus. Do you know him? What, what's going to happen to you when you die? Where's freedom of speech? How come they can have freedom of speech and I can't? God says, don't let them screw you around like that. Uh. <laughs> Understand. You got some friends. Coin A English. Coin A English. Anyhow. Don't let them silence you. Paul, do not let them silence you. Do not let them silence you. And uh, look, they took his head and we still preach him. They took his head. He said, I'll silence you. Cut his head off. <laughs> and here I am. Yaggity yag, yaggity yag, yaggity yag. <laughs> not because I'm a big Paul guy. I'm a big God guy. I mean, I'm, I'm doing it because I found him in Acts. Found him in the Bible. I talk about him. I love the fact that this Roman leader would not allow this type of attack against the freedom of speech. I love that. <clears throat> May we have that kind of courage. May we have that kind of statesmanship. You know, the Greeks were, their concept of human freedom was 
a, as a democracy, their their concept of human freedom was they got that one right. The first divine institution, they got it. They nailed that thing, and they nailed it. They they weren't you know they they nailed that because God nailed it in them. But anyhow. And finally, it is interesting that Roman citizens, and Paul's a Roman citizen, it is interesting that a Roman citizen had more freedom of speech regarding his faith in the Roman court than, than a, a believing Jew in a Jewish court, which was the custodian of the law of God in the priest nation of Israel. Think about that. America, think about that. Mm. You know what that is? Satan on the attack. Satan on the attack. Always destroying freedom. Everybody, everybody's got freedom of speech except Christians. In, a in Athens, they, they had all of these gods. The guy come in and speak about the one that's for real. They shut him down. How is it possible that 30,000 religions have the voice in a city and one walks in and they go like, no, we're not listening to you? How is that possible? How intelligent is that idea? How freedom is that academic freedom? You know why? Because the devil knows that the gospel changes people's lives and hearts. That's why. He'll let you talk about anything but the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised on the dead the third day. You preach that, they'll shut you down in a heartbeat. They'll let 30,000 other religions in, shut yours down. And you know why? It's the most powerful one of all. That's why. The apostate Jews living in Corinth enjoyed the religious freedom of Rome, but didn't want the same privilege for Christian Jews as Paul. Galileo understood the issue of the Jews was religious intolerance and was not a legal issue for Rome. <laughs> and he, listen, he, like Pilate, understood it is interesting that it's, they're only intolerant. These Jews, these Jews in this city of Corinth, they don't have a voice against all the other religious gobbledygook going on. And there was a lot of it, just like in Athens. Polytheism all over the place. Oh, that's fine. You know, we can get along. Paul walks in and says, he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, backs it up in the word of God. They want to kill him. So why should it be any different for you and I? That's the America we live in today. Here's the final thing that Paul learned. If you've been keeping up, this is the sixth. Paul learned another doctrinal principle. That God was faithful to his promise given to Paul. Listen, God is faithful. God says, I have, I am with you. I have a hedge around you. Don't you hesitate. You speak on my behalf. And nobody can harm you. And if they, and if I let them in, give it to them. I didn't let them in for any other reason. You give them the gospel. God is faithful. Listen, and Paul is going to learn that God is faithful even when he's not. He's going to learn that God is faithful when Paul isn't. And let me tell you, that's going to break that man's heart to learn that. And it's going to make a different man on the third missionary trip. The fourth one. It's going to make, when Paul comes out of this mess, he's going to be better than he ever was. <laughs> when the Jews lost their case against Paul, they beat their attorney up. Right there in court. Didn't even let him out. You thought he would give him a chance to hit the street, but they didn't. They beat the stew at him right in court. Does not tell that whole story. And he gets converted. I would have too, wouldn't you? 
He went over to Paul's side. He went over to Paul's side. Became a prominent member. Became a prominent member of the local church at Corinth. That's just interesting. And God wonderful people. Isn't God wonderful? Isn't he wonderful? Our life, our life only gets screwed up when we take our eyes off of him. Amen. That's the only time. All the rest of that stuff, God always is fulfilling his divine purpose in our life. It's a magnificent journey. You ought to keep a, you ought to write, you ought to have a little journal in your life to every once in a while go back and see how faithful God is to your life. This is the greatest thing I ever did was write a journal on God's faithfulness. Sometimes, oh, no, God. God, like, oh, look on page 32. <laughs> you remember this? Oh, yeah. Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us. May the things we've studied about Paul's life reflect upon ours. Most of these things apply to us. In general principles, for sure. If there's ever time when the church needs to be ver vigil, is now. Where our grandchildren will be persecuted for the faith we have in freedom. They'll be persecuted. <clears throat> And it would be because we failed our watch. We know we're not the only knees that have not bowed to Baal. That's obvious, Father. I don't think about that and I don't worry about it. I only worry about my own. I got enough just to deal with my own knees. Be faithful. I bow it. Only to only to one God, and his name is Jesus Christ. I'm about to no other. And God, it has to be more than talk, doesn't it? But you are faithful. You will never leave us nor forsake us. When Paul said, all have forsaken me. Except the Lord. And I discovered that was enough. How wonderful. Well, encourage our hearts, Father. Encourage our hearts for ministry. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him.